today I'm going to be reading the short story Guy Walks Into a Bar by Lee Child. So you may not have ever heard the name Lee Child, but he's a really famous author. You may have heard of one of his most famous characters, Jack Reacher. And in fact, they've made like TV movies, and I think there maybe even is a series coming on Amazon about Jack Reacher. And so the character of Jack Reacher is this retired military cop who sort of travels around the United States wherever the breeze blows in and uh, solves crimes and like beats up bad guys and like um, prevents international espionage and stuff like that. So if, you know, what you're looking for is like great moving literature that's going to win the Pulitzer Prize, Lee Child probably isn't what you want to read. But what's interesting about Lee Child's writing is that it really appeals to a stereotypically male reader, like people who identify with a very traditionally masculine sense of how a person should behave and really aspire to be a traditionally masculine person really like the Jack Reacher books. And I mean, I think that feminine people and women like them as well, but really that target audience are those masculine, manly men. So as you're reading, what I want you to be paying attention to is what are some of the aspects of the Jack Reacher character that a traditionally stereotypically masculine person would find appealing? What sorts of words does um, the character say? What sorts of physical appearance characteristics does the character have? What kinds of actions does Jack Reacher do that somebody who really wants to be stereotypically masculine would want to emulate? They'd want to be the same way. And then there's going to be something about the ending that, at least for me, was kind of surprising. So when we get to that ending, be thinking about that stereotypically masculine audience and how an ending like this might help them shift their perspective about gender roles. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you're reading. And this is Lee Child's Guy Walks Into a Bar. She was about 19, no older, maybe younger. An insurance company would have given her 60 more years to live. I figured a more accurate projection was 36 hours or 36 minutes if things went wrong from the get-go. She was blonde and blue-eyed, but not American. American girls have a glow, a smoothness from many generations of plenty. This girl was different. Her ancestors had known hardship and fear. That inheritance was in her face and her movements. Her eyes were wary. Her body was lean. Not the kind of lean you get from a diet, but the kind of Darwinian kind of lean you get when your grandparents had no food and either starved or didn't. Her movements were fragile and tense, a little alert, a little nervous though on the face of it, she was having a good time as a girl could get. She was in a New York bar drinking beer, listening to a band, and she was in love with the guitar player. That was clear. The part of her gaze that wasn't wary was filled with adoration, and it was all aimed in his direction. She was probably Russian. She was rich. She was at a table near the stage, and she had a pile of ATM Fresh 20s in front of her, and she was paying for each new bottle with one of them, and she wasn't asking for change. The waitresses loved her. There was a guy further back in the room, wedged on an upholstered bench staring at her, her bodyguard presumably. He was a tall, wide man with a shaved head and a black t-shirt under a black suit. He was part of the reason she was drinking beer in a city bar at the age of 19 or less. It wasn't the kind of glossy place that had a policy about underage rich girls, either for or against. It was a scruffy dive on Bleecker Street, staffed by skinny kids trying to make tuition money, and I guess they had looked at her and her minder and made a snap decision against trouble in favor of tips. I watched her for a minute, and then I looked away. My name is Jack Reacher, and once I was a military cop, with heavy emphasis on the past tense. I have been out nearly as long as I was in, but old habits die hard. I stepped into the bar the same way I always step anywhere, which is carefully. One thirty in the morning, I had ridden the A train to West 4th and walked south on 6th Avenue, then made the left on Bleecker and checked the sidewalks. I wanted music, but not the kind that drives large numbers of patrons outside to smoke. The smallest knot of people stood next to a place with half a flight of stairs leading up to its door. There was a shiny black Mercedes sedan parked on the curb with a driver behind the wheel. 
The music coming out of the place was filtered and dulled by the walls, but I could hear an agile bass line and some snappy drumming. So I walked up the stairs and paid a $5 cover and shouldered my way inside. Two exits. One, the door I had just come through. The other, at the end of a long, dark restroom corridor way in the back. The room was narrow and about 90 feet deep. A bar on the left and the front, then some upholstered horseshoe benches, then a cluster of freestanding tables on what, on other nights, might have been a dance floor. Then the stage with the band on it. The band looked as if it had been put together by accident after a misfiling incident at the talent agency. The bass player was a stout old black guy in a suit with a vest. He was plucking away at an upright bass fiddle. The drummer could have been his uncle. He was a big old guy sprawled comfortably behind a small, simple kit. The singer was also a harmonica player and was older than the bass player and younger than the drummer and bigger than either one. The guitarist was completely different. He was young and white and small, maybe 20, maybe 5 foot 6, maybe 130 pounds. He had a fancy blue guitar wired to a crisp new amplifier, and together the instrument and the electronics made sharp sounds full of space and echoes. The amp must have been turned up to 11. The sound was incredibly loud. It was as if the air in the room was locked solid. It had no more capacity for volume. But the music was good. The three black guys were old pros, and the white kid knew all the notes, and when and how and in what order to play them. He was wearing a red t-shirt and black pants and white tennis shoes. He had a very serious expression on his face. He looked foreign, maybe Russian too. I spent the first half of the song checking the room, counting people, scanning faces, parsing body language. Old habits die hard. There were two guys facing each other across a table with their hands underneath it, one selling, one buying, obviously, the deal done by feel and confirmed with furtive glances. The bar staff was scamming the owner by selling store-bought beer out of an ice chest. Two out of the three domestic bottles were legit from the refrigerator cabinets, and then the third came from their own cooler. I got one of them. A wet label at a big margin. I carried the bottle to a corner seat and sat down with my back to the wall. It was at that point that I saw the girl alone at her table and her bodyguard on his bench. I guessed the Mercedes outside was theirs. I guessed Daddy was a B-grade oligarch, millions but not billions, indulging his daughter with four years at NYU and a credit card that never stopped working. Just two people out of 80 in the room, no big deal, until I saw two other guys. They were a pair, tall, young, white men, cheap, tight leather jackets, heads shaved by blunt razors that had left nicks and scabs. More Russians, probably. Operators, no question. Connected, no doubt. Probably not the best wor the world has ever seen, but probably not the worst either. They were sitting far apart from each other, but their twin gazes were trained on the girl alone at the table. They were tense, determined, to some ner degree nervous. I recognized the signs. Many times I had felt the same way myself. They were about to go into action. So two B-grade oligarchs had a beef, and one was protecting his kid with drivers and bodyguards. The other was sending guys around the world to snatch her. Then would come ransom and extortion and demands, and fortunes would change hands, or uranium leases or oil rights or coal or gas. Business Moscow style. But not usually successful business. Kidnappings have a thousand different dynamics and go wrong a thousand different ways. In my experience, average life expectancy for a kidnap victim is 36 hours. Some survive, but most don't. Some die right away in the initial panic. The girl's pile of 20s was attracting waitresses like wasps at a picnic, and she wasn't shooing any of them away. She was taking one fresh bottle after another, and beer is beer. She was going to have to visit the restroom soon and often and the restroom corridor was long and dark, and it had a street exit at the end of it. I watched her in the gaudy, reflected light, with the music shrieking and pounding all around me. The two guys watched her. Her bodyguard watched her. She watched the guitarist. He was concentrating hard, key changes and choruses, but from time to time he would lift his head and smile, mostly at the glory of being up on stage, but twice directly at the girl. The first of those smiles was shy, and the second was a bit wider. The girl stood up. She butted the lip of her table with her thighs and shuffled out from behind it and headed for the corridor in the back. I got there first. The sound of the band howled through it. 
The ladies' room was halfway down. The men's room was all the way at the end. I leaned on the wall and watched the girl walk toward me. She was up on high heels, and she was wearing tight pants, and her steps were short and precise. Not drunk yet, she was Russian. She put a pale palm on the restroom door and pushed. She went inside. Less than ten seconds later, the two guys stepped into the corridor. I guessed they would wait there for her, but they didn't. They glanced at me like I was part of the architecture and shouldered in through the ladies' room door, one after the other. The door slammed behind them. The music played on. I went in after them. Every day brings something new. I had never been in a women's bathroom before. Stalls on the right, sinks on the left, bright light and the smell of perfume. The girl was standing near the back wall. The two guys were facing her. Their backs were to me. I said, hey, but they didn't hear. Too much noise. I caught them by the elbows, one in each hand. They spun around, ready to fight, but then they stopped. I am bigger than the Frigidaires they had been dreaming about back home. They stood still for a second, then pushed past me and pulled the door and headed out. The girl looked at me for a moment with an emotion I couldn't read, and then I left her to do what she needed to do. I went back to my seat. The two guys were already back in theirs. The bodyguard was impassive. He was watching the stage. The band was finishing up. The girl was still in the bathroom. The music stopped. The two guys got up and headed back towards the corridor. The room was suddenly crowded with people standing and moving. I went over to the bodyguard and tapped him on the shoulder and pointed. He took no notice. He didn't move at all until the guitar player started backing away from the stage. Then he got up. The two movements perfectly synchronized, and I knew I'd gotten it all wrong. Not an indulged daughter, an indulged son. Daddy had bought the guitar and the amp and hired backup musicians, the boy's dream. Out of the bedroom, onto the stage. His driver at the curb, his bodyguard watching all the way. Not a team of two from his rival, but a team of three. An adoring groupie, the boy's dream. A classic honey trap. The last minute tactical conference in the bathroom, and then action. I shoved my way through the back and got to the street well ahead of the bodyguard, just as the girl was hugging the boy and turning him through a half circle and pushing him toward the two guys. I hit the first one hard and the second one harder, and I got blood from his mouth all over my shirt. The two guys went down, and the girl fled, and then the bodyguard showed up. I made him give me his t-shirt. Bloodstains attract attention. Then I left to the front. The obvious move would have been to turn right, so I turned left, and I got on the sixth train at Bleecker and Lafayette heading north, the last but one car. I settled in and checked the faces. Old habits die hard. <laughs>